It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting. Well, welcome to It's So Interesting, where people talk about their work and life experience. I am George Spitzer. Today I'm talking with Bob Murphy, who is a commercial diver. Okay, let's get right to it. What I'd like to understand, because I should preface my question by saying that I almost drowned in a bathtub. Mm -hmm. So there you are in an ocean, mm -hmm. probably more than 10 feet below, or sometimes much more than that. And, you know, you don't have an option if something goes wrong. And you can't, I assume, panic while you're down there. So how... Is this something that people are just born with, or do you have to steal yourself? Or do you, is this training? Or, I mean, tell me, how do you deal with that? Well, a little bit of all of the above. Uh, you hit one nail on the head is if you do get in trouble when you're diving, you can't panic. You have to train yourself to not panic because the worst thing you can do is panic and lose control, and I've seen it happen. The other thing is you can't be claustrophobic. People who are claustrophobic can't stand to be in a helmet. And I've seen a couple of guys and trying to start out and trying to do it and said, no, I can't, I don't like it. And then sometimes you have to enter enclosed spaces underwater. So you can't be claustrophobic in that regard. So uh, uh, I would imagine if you have a metal helmet on you yeah. and you're in mostly dark water, with those two levels of claustrophobia, so to speak, going inside some structure underwater, becomes a detail. Uh, almost, yeah, almost. Um, coincidentally, since you mentioned that, to give you a better sense of it, when you, one of the things I learned from one of the guys, he says, when you're working in dark water, keep your eyes closed. He says, that way you won't try to psychologically see when you can't, and you'll start using your other instincts, and he was right. You work better, and also after a while you get used to it. You learn how to do it. You, you practice working in the dark, you know, but you're not always in the dark, but a lot of the time you are. A lot of those jobs in Honolulu we did, he had great visibility. After, you know, you're out there with big construction equipment and you're digging on the bottom or you're putting stuff down, you stir up the, the bottom, and so you're working in a cloud a lot of the time. For years I had a contract working in the port of Los Angeles, and uh, you were wind up in the, in the harbor bottom over there and you really stir it up and you're in the dark all day long. You know, your work not on the bottom is just being in the dark. So you you have to learn how to do that. Well, if you're in the dark, how do you know where you are? I mean, you have to see what you're doing, right? Well, you learn how to navigate off off landmarks. Uh huh. Um, oh, for instance, in the port of Los Angeles, we'd uh, doing a lot of work under docks, so you'd have pilings nearby, so you'd know where this piling was and that piling was. You're in shallow water most of the time, you know, 50 feet and shallower. So you'd I'd always know that my hose was leading me towards the outside of the harbor or the, the channel end of the harbor so I'd know which direction that was. And then I know when I faced away from my hose or faced towards my hose, rather, that this side would be to my left and the other direction would be towards my right so I'd know where that was. And you always kind of have it in the back of your mind how you got to where you are. So you have your own internal geolocator system. <laughs> More or uh, less, uh, yeah. Pre-iPhone, so to and speak. And you, you know which way your hose leads to help you navigate. And uh, if you do get lost, you've got guys on the radio to help you get straightened out. They can tell you where your bubbles are coming up. And, you know, if you face your hose, they'll tell you move so many feet to your left or so many feet to your right and help you get navigated. If you get off, say you're on a pipeline, you get off the pipeline, you would say to me... Uh, on the radio, face your hose, we're going to take all the slack out of it, move 30 feet to your right, and you'd watch my bubbles and help me find it again. This is beginning to sound like what I've been reading uh, about people who go, astronauts who go to the capsule in space. Yeah. Is, is this parallel? Well, you know, it's funny, but uh, some of those photos, those great photos NASA took of those guys going outside uh, the space shuttle when they fixed that giant mirror on the telescope up there, I thought that was just like commercial diving going out there. And the work they did was phenomenal. I mean, fixing those mirrors and, and, and putting them just right. But they knew how to navigate, and they knew how to get themselves here and there. Of course, they had, I, I'm guessing they had great visibility. I don't know what it's <laughs> like in space. It, it, from the photos, there was terrific light. But that doesn't mean... I don't know if they could see or not. Were they blinded by the light, so to speak? No pun intended there. Um, or was it, 
you know, the, the photos were fantastic and brilliant. But it, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit similar. Um, and, and in a way... Not quite so far away. <laughs> <laughs> right. As dangerous. Um, Interestingly, since you mentioned that, George, I've read over the years that uh, a lot of the initial astronauts trained uh, with commercial divers, and they trained uh, in tanks and water in Florida or someplace like that. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I was curious about is, I guess, the whole idea of fear. Uh, does that translate to the rest of your lifestyle, or you're just a normal bloke on the ground, but when you get underwater, you are fearless? No, it's it, it's not. Fear, when you're doing the construction work, it's so well thought out and so well planned, and, and that's the ticket. You have to plan what you're doing beforehand. Now the requirements for planning are so over the top, it's incredible. But fear, shall we say, you're not really fearful or afraid. However, shall we say there's a healthy skepticism, and there's a time when you might have to go do dangerous things where you definitely have the butterflies in your stomach. But you're going to go down there. You're going to have it all planned out. You're going to get in. You're going to get out. You're going to do your job. We, we had I worked for a guy named with uh, Dave Hansen, whose stepfather was Al Hansen. He dove till he was 76 years old in L.A. Harbor. He was a tough old guy from Catalina. Him and his wife had the, the diving um, business in Catalina back in the 1950s and 60s. And Al used to have an expression. He'd say, the job's over before I start it. I've done it so many times the night before in my garage. I know exactly what I'm going to do. And Al was a good guy to go go listen to and talk to. I mean, he really knew his business. It must be a pretty small and tight fraternity or brotherhood. Uh, you yeah. got dams, all the, the dams that are uh, in the Midwest and all through the western U.S., that's, a lot of that is maintained by divers. Um, there's, there's a whole group of guys that are out in the um, desert areas that maintain the water structures and the water systems out there for drinking water, metropolitan water districts. There's guys who go all over the country. There's an interesting thing. I bid on some jobs a few years back, and it wasn't our real niche, so uh, we did only a little bit of that work. In so many communities right here in Southern California, their water reservoirs are underground, and there might be big concrete tanks right in the middle of town, and every so often, for example, they need to be cleaned. So they have guys, and super, super strict requirements, guys have to don a suit that's never been anywhere else, it's got to be cleaned, certified, go into these tanks, and very methodically and slowly clean any growths that might get on the walls or the floors, no dust, they don't want any, anything that could contaminate. Um, and that's a whole sub-industry in and of itself. And these guys go around with these sort of underwater vacuum cleaners and do just that. And I went out to Riverside to bid this thing, and I'm looking for this big water tank, and I realized I was standing on it, and it was underneath, I think it was a golf course. Was, they had built a golf course on top. Oh, no, it was a university that was on one of the grounds of a university. And there'll be places like that all over certain municipalities. That was a real eye-opener to me, too. And then, of course, you mentioned you were in the Los Angeles Harbor. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there are all those, we don't think it, you see these wharves, you see the big ships coming up against them. And it just occurred to me, somebody has to go down there and build and put all those pilings in. Yeah. Well, the piles get driven. It was uh, working at the Port of L.A., which I did for a 20-year period, was a real interesting project because in the old days, all the, the, the pilings, all the piers were built on wooden pilings, right? Well, over a period of time, uh, the waters got cleaned up a little bit and weren't quite so polluted, they tell me. And by the time I got there, waters were pretty good. And what happened was they had these insects underwater that eat the wooden pilings. And they're called a torito. The Spanish word is teredo, which is those shipworms that used to eat the Spanish ships when they first came to the Western world back in the 15 and 1600s. And these sh shipworms would bore holes in the ships and the pilings, and after a while, eat, eat them away, just like termites do on land. And your pilings would go away. So the city of L.A. winds up replacing way too many of these wooden pilings, it, it's not cost effective. So they started a whole maintenance program, which is where we came in, and we had to wrap these pilings in a plastic wrap from a couple of feet below the surface 
uh, below the ocean bottom, rather, to a couple of feet above the highest tide. And what we basically did was each and every pile in L.A. Harbor we had to encapsulate to prevent water from getting in, which then would prevent the, the bugs from getting in. <laughs> that, that begs the question, in your estimation, how many pilings are there? I don't know. At that time when I started, uh, there were tens and tens of thousands at that time. And this program had gone on before me, and it goes on to this day. Some of my buddies still work it. The city since then has taken out a lot of the old wooden docks. They outlived their usefulness, their lifespan, etc. And what with the advent of containers heavier cargo uh, since the 1960s. They've gone to concrete pilings and concrete docks um, so they can handle the big cranes that are necessary. It's just a bigger, beefier dock than it used to be. Interestingly, a lot of the concrete gets cracks in it, and then what happens over time is the water seeps into the rebar inside, causes rust, and it causes spalling, which is just like pieces of the concrete start to break off. Just like a highway. Just like a highway, just like a highway bridge. It's a good analogy, yeah. So there's a, no, a new technology needed for fixing those, and there's, there's a lot of similar things you do. You'd have to clean the growth off them, maybe encapsulate, encapsulate them underwater, and pour concrete inside that encapsulation. Uh, when you're like putting a sock over the pilings. <laughs> yeah. when, when, you're, when you've been down working underwater, are you recently retired from this? Because yeah. it's, it's a physically difficult activity. Right. And um, how many years were you actually in the water? Oh, a lot of years. My boss and I figured out I probably had more bottom time than anybody else in the United States over a five-year period. Bottom time is time actually in the water that uh, you'd count. And I used to go in the water every day. We'd start work at 6.30. We'd get in the water by 7, 7.15 typically, 7.30. And be there. Our quitting time was was at 4:30. Um, be in the water till 3:30. Come out for lunch. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask. Do you come yeah, out for come food? out for lunch? Yeah. Maybe we, uh, we always wore dry suits. You know, mm -hmm. we wore hard hat gear with mm -hmm. um, dry suits. So you might come out once or twice to use a bathroom during the course of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, or you know, sometimes you'd have to. You'd, the city would assign us where to go. So. I'd go to your dock, we'd do something there for the morning, maybe do an inspection, then they'd want us to get an inspection done in another dock in another place, so we'd come up and ride the boat to the next location and maybe a third location during the course of a day. So, so at this point, would it be fair to say you're one of a handful of people or maybe the only one who has intimate knowledge of the L.A. Harbor, like the back of your hand? There's a handful of us, yeah. Who, yeah, there's just a few of us. And therefore, you are an expert in that area. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's funny. When I go down there, I'll, I'll be driving around, uh, and whoever I'm with, I'll say, you know, under that dock over there is where you'll see a lot of you'll see a lot of this or a lot of that. Or they had such bad undermining in that area. Or that area over there, you can look around real carefully, and you might see a few lobster or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they'd look at me like, what are you talking about? I'd say, <laughs> oh, yeah. And that area over there, we... Did this and we did that. It's, uh, but it's true. Yeah, it's very true. I'll tell you a good one. Back in the year 2000, we did a job off Morro Bay. Uh, we had a crew of guys out there, and we were pulling all the fiber optic cable in that came from overseas to here, right, for the internet, the banking, whatnot. And they pulled. We pulled in a couple from China and a couple from Japan, and I forget where else. But what they did, the technology was they'd go up on the hills above Morro Bay, and they'd drill a hole down in the ground. They'd drill a hole way in the ground, and and then they'd push that that uh, pipe offshore. And it would be maybe a six-inch pipe, seven-inch diameter pipe. They'd push it offshore to a certain location at a certain depth, pop it up to the surface, push a little more, then call us in and say, it's at this location. They'd give us a GPS coordinates. We'd go out on a vessel, locate it, and then prepare the pipe a little bit. Then a ship would come with a big cable that stretched all the way to Japan. We would take the bitter end of the cable from them, stick it through the pipe, and they'd pull it up to the beach. And through a process of doing that a number of times until they had uh, a cable strong enough to pull the final fiber optic cable, they'd pull it all the way up to the beach, plug, plug it into their little house, 
and that's where all your stuff comes from across the ocean. Then they, they run the cables now up to San Francisco and down to Los Angeles and San Diego and everywhere they needed to, and eventually they got them into our homes and our bank buildings and our cities all around here, but that's where the main trunk lines come in. So that was pretty fascinating work. Uh, so yeah. it's all physical. It's not in the cloud. What do you mean? Well, I'm talking about the Internet. We don't perceive the Internet and oh. electronics as you know, an electronic cloud. And you're saying, That's, yeah, there's also there are actual cables and pipes. There's a lot of cables that are going around the world on the ocean, and, mm -hmm. and they have certain requirements that the way they have to be laid. You know, And it's all phone companies. And now, Even though you're not going doing any bottom work now because uh -huh. you're retired from that, you're still very active in that field by being by becoming an expert because of your experience. Right? right. I get asked by people from time to time to do some consulting, so I do that mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, legal firms maybe who have a case or some people who are working on things. I've helped do some bids for different mm -hmm. diving companies uh, from time to time when we bid jobs. Um, so I stay, keep my hand in it that way, yeah. I'd like to wrap up by um, asking you for advice. What would you recommend for someone who wants to be in that business? What qualities of character, if not physically, are needed? Well, what qualities of character? A lot of the work, you're going to be traveling all the time. So you have to be willing to move around. Uh, you have to be willing to go offshore for long periods of time. So you have to consider if you want to do that. A lot of guys get burned out on that when they're in their 30s. But I, I used to get asked that a lot by when I was real active in the Port of L.A. I'd have a lot of um, parents call me. My son wants to go to be a commercial diver. You know, I, can I ask you some questions? And I'd, I'd usually tell them a few things. I'd say, I like it if Santa Barbara Community College, SBCC right here, has one of the best marine tech programs that is out there, and commercial diving training is a part of it. But more than that, you've got two years, you get a two-year associate's degree out of it, and they teach you all the tools of the trade that you need to know, the welding, the burning, and all the topside stuff. You might be able to learn a lot about navigation, skippering a ship, a vessel. And I'd, I I would always tell the parents, I said, and I'd tell the kids too, I'd say, Get some letters after your name. I said, that's becoming more and more popular. You know, ultimately, if you could have a Ph.D., if you could have an engineering thing after your name, it's surprising to me how many people with letters after their name would get jobs when they really didn't know as much as others might, you know. You know, anybody can blow bubbles. you got to have a trade to do. you got to know what to do when, you're, when someone's paying you to be down there, and you have to be very, very efficient at it. So don't just think that, you know, someone's going to pay you to go blow bubbles. You've got to be able to be a good welder when you're down there. You have to be able to be a good scientist, write excellent reports. A lot of what, what I did was write reports, especially for the Port of L.A. The engineering department would say, we need this inspected, this inspected, this inspected. So we'd have to do that and then write the reports for them and then work with the engineers and um, like that. So get some letters after your name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I've been talking with Bob Murphy. Uh, thank you for being here, Bob. And if you'd like to contact him again for this show or for any other show, go to itssointeresting.com, and you can contact Bob through that website. Thanks, and, George. Right. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting.